Well, you mean four and a half billion years. It's only acutely toxic for 250,000, but it continues to be toxic for billions of years. But, you know, if you think about Love Canal, right, this was the chemical dump up in the northeast. And, you know, after a while, they paved it over, and it sat there for a while, and developers came along and said, wow, look at that great place to put a bunch of houses. And they built a whole neighborhood on top of it. They couldn't even keep track of chemical waste for a generation. How are we going to keep track of nuclear waste for 250,000 years? It just isn't going to happen. But the corporation that made the money on that plant will be long gone by then. Uh, you, you touched on something interesting, Arnie, which is subsidies. And um, this, kind of, this kind of steps outside of just looking at nuclear energy. But it, isn't it interesting that the only subsidies that they seem to be able to curtail or cut altogether are those going to renewable energy, biofuels, you know, the uh, um, bioethanol and alcohol fuel, losing all the federal subsidies and incentives this year. Are, how, how can that be? You know, and those are fractional uh, on, on a dollar sort of subsidies when you compare them to what petroleum industry or what nuclear industry, and I guess do you have figures for what the subsidies are in the nuclear uh, industry? Or we know them from petroleum and stuff, but do you know what they would kind of amount to? Well, uh, Union of Concerned Scientists has a paper up on their website that, that details it. But basically, the cost at the bus bars, it leaves the power plant that we think we're paying is five cents, and it really should be 10 cents. So essentially, uh -huh. your electric bill, which is probably 13 or 14 cents really should be 20 cents if we factored in all of those subsidies. But, and, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. The nuclear industry has, through the Department of Energy, gets enormous subsidies, and now we're on to thorium reactors and small modular reactors and advanced power reactors. The, um, the government funded a, an organization called New Start, whose purpose was to uh, get the... Uh, advanced reactors up and running that are going on in Georgia. And they, we were actually, through our tax dollars, paying New Start and New Start's attorneys to prevent the public from being involved in the process. So public money went to a, a to private be. corporation to prevent the public from participating in the licensing process. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. Well, you know, <laughs> this, this whole thing is so unnecessary, too, because Basically, nuclear power and oil and coal, they're all based on things that eventually run out. You know, and so whatever, well, whoever controls the limited amount of those things makes the money. And so there's a real vested interest in industries to use things that run out because they can make way more money on something where it has an unlimited supply, which is like solar energy. Now, uh, you know, Arnie may agree with me on this, which is we're actually both very much in favor of nuclear power, although it doesn't sound like it. But the thing is, where do you put a nuclear power plant? The answer is there is a right place to put it in relation to people, and that's 92 million miles away. It's called the sun, okay? So when the nuclear power plant is that far away, you don't even need a containment vessel, okay? So the energy coming from the sun is something we're going to have for four and a half billion years. In fact, well, that's about as long as some nuclear waste lasts. So, so when the sun burns out, yes, we have other problems, you know. But until then, solar energy is this annoying thing to corporations because no one has to directly pay for it. It falls everywhere. There's no channeling it or collecting it or keeping people away from it. So here we are talking about 20, 40, 50 cent a kilowatt electricity from these um, you know, advanced nuclear power plants, and yet uh, some people in the world pay that amount for electricity right now from oil. Uh, you know, I'm working on a project in Latin America where this major city is running on bunker oil, in other words, the worst diesel oil you can get, and they're paying, you know, 20, 30 cents a kilowatt for the electricity. We're working with them to go ahead and start going to solutions to this problem. So we're going ahead and making alcohol which we can then use to run a generator, the same generator that's running on diesel fuel right now, for 10 cents a kilowatt. And, you know, I've got a long history with this. Back during the Diablo Canyon protests, I sent down some of my staff from my alcohol fuel company with a big six-cylinder generator on the back running on alcohol, and we had a big sign that says, Diablo Canyon Power, 10 cents a kilowatt, 
this alcohol power three cents a kilowatt. Even in the little generator that we're doing, they're running the emergency medical, you know, uh, center for all the protesters. So, you know, it's been true for a long time that nuclear power isn't economical, but it is a great giveaway program to major corporations. Now, the subsidies thing just drives me up the wall. You know, our, our wonderful Senator Dianne Feinstein uh, married uh, Oklahoma oil Senator Tom Coburn and said, oh, we can't afford alcohol fuel subsidies because we have a deficit going on and all that. And they got, for the first time, since Republicans have tried to get rid of this, you know, subsidy, they finally succeeded after, like, since Jimmy Carter. So that's decades. So, but there's a difference between nuclear subsidies and oil subsidies and renewable subsidies. In the case of alcohol fuel, because we make it in this country from our sunlight, right? Carbohydrates come from the sun, and we make those into alcohol. When, we, when someone buys a dollar of alcohol here in the U.S., it generates three dollars in tax revenues. So for every dollar of subsidy, sorry, every dollar of subsidy, not dollar of purchase, it creates three new dollars of taxable events because all the parts of the plant are made here, all the people who work on the plant are here, and so they spend their money here. Uh, you know, all that cycles back into the economy, which creates tax revenue. So in the towns in the Midwest where there are alcohol plants, the pools are open, the libraries are open, all the public services are happening because taxes are being paid. We, when we pay for oil or nuclear subsidies, that's money flushed down the, wherever you're flushing it permanently. It just goes away. It's like military spending. So uh, when we do renewables, we are using something that is American, sun falling on our place, and it's made by people doing work that can't be outsourced. The sunlight falls here, you know, and it's not something that we can ignore as an incredibly important part of our economy, much less, you know, ignore it from the environment. I mean, you're talking about stuff in nuclear power plants where a tablespoon of that fuel, if you distributed it equally to all the people in the world, would kill every one of them. You only need a couple of atoms of plutonium in your lungs to guarantee your death. So when we're talking about Fukushima and we're talking about what happens if the, the, the fuel from number four cooling pond falls on the ground when the building falls over and explodes into fire, we're talking about the winds of the earth carrying death around the northern hemisphere. This is, this is not a small localized event. This is something that everyone in the northern airspace has a say in or should. That's phenomenal. Arnie, are, are, um, are you as concerned? Dan Hirsch, when he was on our program back in April last year, um, was talking about the top ten list in the U.S. And it's easy to get to you know, think, oh, this is Japan's problem or Chernobyl's, Russia's problem. He had India Point and... Uh, San Onofre right up there at the top of the list, but are, are those things, are there places beyond LA that you're looking with concern right now? Well, I've said that there's um, the 23 nukes that are just like Fukushima Daiichi should be shut down. Th th that means there's still 80 running, but those 23 are just too similar and too weak uh, to continue operation. But even uh, if you shut them down, you, you can't, it's not like a light switch, right? I mean, you can't just turn right. that off and everything's great and you can just go, right. how do you do that? How do you well, shut them down? Well, you've got to get the fuel out of the pools and into dry cask storage, which is an air-cooled storage that sits on the ground. Now, Fukushima Daiichi had dry cask storage, and all the dry casks survived the earthquake and the tsunami just fine. So the, the biggest problem facing uh, the United States right now is to get all of the fuel out of the pools and onto the ground in these dry cast storage. The reason we're not doing it is because the industry doesn't want to spend the money and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is letting them get away with it. But to get back to your question about Dan, yeah, there's, uh, in addition to the 23 BWRs that are identical to Fukushima, the two most dangerous plants in the country um, uh, are San Onofre, and Indian Point because of emergency planning and their age. Uh, we've learned a lot more about seismic issues at San Onofre and Indian Point. They're both near enormous concentrations of people. So the, the, the combination of the probability of an accident being greater than we anticipated 
and the population has grown around these nuclear plants for 40 years, that, that's a double whammy, and, and I don't think those licenses should be, uh, should be extended. The, the other one that scares me is down in, uh, uh, at, at the Oconee units in uh, South Carolina. Uh, right upstream from them is a, uh, is a huge hydroelectric dam. Now, hydroelectric oh. dams don't fail very often, but you don't get tsunamis off of Japan very often either. And if that hydroelectric dam were to fail, um, it would produce about a 50-foot wave that come right over that nuclear uh, facility. And yet the NRC said, well, the probability of that dam failing is low, so therefore we're not going to worry about it. And, you know, Dan, Dan said before, they, to my mind, the key is that engineers design really well for the design bases. Now, you tell them that an earthquake will be a 7, they'll build a plant to withstand a 7. The problem is that, that Mother Nature doesn't believe in design bases. And sooner or later, you get an 8 or a 9 or a 65-foot tsunami or a dam breaking, and the engineers didn't design for it, and the building fails. Well, then again, of course, Arnie, I think, I think actually this is a quote from you, which is never use the word sandbags and nuclear power in the same sentence. <laughs> you know, uh, but, uh, you know, totally not talked about in the press were the two plants on the Mississippi River, gosh, they're next to water again, you know, like yeah. Fukushima, that were undergoing flooding at the same time Fukushima was in the news. And you saw pictures of the nuclear power plant inside a little dam, almost looking like it's floating in the river while the river had come up around it. It's like anywhere you put a nuclear power plant, it's pretty close to the water level of where it is. They don't pump the water uphill very far. You know, the plant is right there next to the you know, next to the water source. So you got places like the one in the Philippines where there's a nuclear power plant at the foot of a volcano on an earthquake fault <laughs> with a V-shaped valley that would focus a 20-foot tsunami to become 80 feet by the time it reached the plant. It's like, who approved that one, you know? <laughs> but the whole point is we don't have to do these things. Yeah. We have sources of energy right now that are very practical uh, and can replace electricity uh, totally economically, uh, especially in other parts of the world that don't have big centralized power stations. You know, in the United States, we have big hydro plants, we've got coal burning, we've got big natural gas plants, and we've got these nuclear power plants that feed a grid. Well, we have about 300 million people, so that kind of makes sense. But then you look at Ethiopia. It has 120 million people. About, you know, close to a third of the United States, a little more. No grid, no roads to 60% of the villages, and they need electricity. It's all generators. You know, so how do you fix it for the rest of the world? Well, you have to replace the fossil fuel that those generators are running on with something that's clean, and that would be alcohol fuel, which is based on solar energy. Uh, we look at around the world people doing uh, electrical generation with fossil fuels and we don't we are not associated very well with that in the United States that most of the world isn't talking about um, pollution from uh, nuclear waste or nuclear fuel they're talking about real honest to God air pollution from burning fossil fuels for electricity so we have many levels of replacing electricity we need to go to but nuclear power plant is uh, you know, basically a, a Rube Goldberg idea that only could get sold in an industrialized country where they have people selling the machinery to go into them. Other places can't even consider nuclear, and I guess that's to their benefit, but when you take a look at the air pollution problems in other countries, it's enormous. And nuclear power, you know, I mean, although we have all electric homes in the U.S. which are nuclear powered, in most of the world, half the people in the world cook over wood or charcoal or kerosene mm. inside their their house with three rocks in a pot so half the world has no use for nuclear power even for cooking and those people are dying from inhalation of fossil fuel or wood smoke those people could be using alcohol which is practically pollution free and safe to use indoors so you know you start looking at the nuclear thing in the whole world context and you go well it doesn't apply to most of the people in the world why are we doing it anywhere mm -hmm. well the answer is because we can because the, you know the engineers said we could build this cool thing but you know we really can't 
You know, when you start boiling water in, a, uh, in any kind of boiler, things wear out. 